Tonight, In the Life presents the retrospective historical blindness about the lives. It was serious, serious consequence if you were found to be lesbian or gay. The accomplishments. Musically, he was an immeasurable influence on generations. And the progress. We were doing this very revolutionary picketing in the 1960s. Of those who came before Stonewall. Pick your lazy butt up, get it out on the street, and stop making everyone else do the work for you. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the Pride Foundation, the Gill Foundation, and In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life. I'm Leslie Gore. The Stonewall Rebellion of 1969 is commonly considered to have launched the gay rights movement, but our community did not spring fully formed from the brow of Stonewall. Many were already leading their lives honestly, often openly, and sometimes loudly. Even the modern gay rights movement had begun before that small group of Greenwich villagers got fed up one night in June and through the punch felt round the world. So tonight, in honor of those who preceded Stonewall, whose accomplishments or identities have been left out of mainstream history, and who are too frequently absent from even the LGBT community's own consciousness, In the Life challenges the Western world's historical blindness. Excavating a lost artist. She was the first artist to really deal with lesbian life and personalities as her primary subject matter. Throwing back the curtain on an earlier civil rights movement. These liberal and progressive movements were trying to make social change and trying to say that they wanted a better world, but they didn't want an openly gay person in their better world. Celebrating a quiet life. From that day on, they said, she never looked back. She saw that this was the way that she was going to be able to get what she wanted. And drumming up Duke Ellington's unsung partner. A silent star of the jazz world, Billy Strayhorn began his prolific career in the early 1930s. Nearly 75 years later, he is recognized as one of America's greatest composers. While you may not know his name, chances are you know his music. Pittsburgh people love their giants, and he has always been well-known, cherished, as one of the great artists the city has produced. Musically, he was an immeasurable influence on, on generations. Frank Sinatra wanted to record him, Billy A. Strayhorn. And who's, who was bigger than Frank Sinatra in terms of the music business? Strayhorn was blessed with a musical gift and bought himself a piano with money that he earned from delivering newspapers in the fifth grade, paid for his own piano lessons, and piles of sheet music that he bought. Hey Do's 1996 biography, Lush Life, has helped revive interest in the music and life of Billy Strayhorn. Well, his original dream was to be a classical musician, and he learned pretty quickly that that was out of the question. There was virtually no such thing as a black classical musician when he graduated from high school in 1932. So he shifted over to jazz early on. By the time he was in his late teens, he had already written a complete musical show, fantastic rhythm that was a tremendous success. The two songs that tell me the most about Billy Strayhorn as a human being as well as an artist are Lush Life and Something to Live For. There's a poignance there that really touches one deeply. In Lush Life, the tone of the song, a sense that it would be hard because of all the social pressure. A lush life. That reflected a gay sensibility of a time when life was very difficult. It's an art song of gay life of that period. 
So here we have a person with two pretty big strikes against him in those days, being African-American, wanting to write a classical music, being gay on top of that, and then he compounded the problem by deciding early on to not deny his homosexuality. I want something to live for. Someone and the music world was forever changed in 1938 when Billy performed for another jazz legend. Strahan was 23 when he met Duke Ellington, and thank God he did. They spent the next 30 years working very closely together, and their work is inextricable from then on. Well, I always connected him with Duke Ellington, because he was like Duke's right-hand man. Everybody was touched by Billy Strayhorn. I mean, if you were touched by Duke, you had to be touched by Billy Strayhorn. Did you It was Duke who really appreciated and really loved Billy Strayhorn, understood where he was coming from musically. I mean, even though he didn't get the credit in some cases until later on, but everything comes out in the wash in the long run. Billy, who lived his life as an openly gay man, worked quietly in Ellington's shadow for most of his career. Today, He's credited with composing hundreds of songs, including Ellington orchestra standards like Take the A-Train, a musical homage to Billy's first trip to Duke's home in Harlem. When Billy Strayhorn moved to New York, he found an insular world of like-minded spirits who supported each other. His exposure to the world of cafe society in New York was the beginning of a coming of age for Billy Strayhorn as a man, as a gay man. And in 1939, Billy met Aaron Bridgers, with whom he shared a decade-long relationship at the height of his career. He was one of the few that had the courage to deal with it, take me or leave me. I mean, the fact that he was black, <laughs> gay, <laughs> you know, the business is homophobic. <laughs> I mean, that's, and it still is to this day. So the fact that he got with somebody like Duke, where he was able to express his feelings, his music, it was an opening for him. Duke Ellington recognized Billy Strayhorn's genius, and he was not encumbered by Billy Strayhorn's homosexuality. And that's a testament to Ellington's accepting Billy Strayhorn, to, utterly regardless of his, of his sexual orientation. Which wigs me over her shoulder. In fact, Billy's sexuality was perhaps one reason for Duke's ultimate confidence. There's a great story about uh, Duke Ellington assigning Billy to watch over Lena Horn. He had his eye on Lena Horn, and he didn't want anyone else to get next to her while he was out of town, so he assigned Billy to the Lena Horn watch, and Lena fell in love with Billy. Of course, there remained a very close friendship. She was the sort of person who respected quality, and she saw the quality in this man and his talent and his kindness. As did others, like Bill Coleman, who was a close friend for nearly 20 years. I met him in the, the middle or late part of 1948 or sometime in 49. And over the years, he began to invite me to recording sessions. In watching Duke and, and Strayhorn record, when they were writing together or when they were collaborating, I wouldn't hazard a guess as to who was doing what. The tremendous respect that the two men had for each other resulted in one of the most precious musical resources in jazz. In 1967, Billy Strayhorn succumbed to cancer marking the end of a more than quarter century long career, the legacy of which still lives on. At Billy Strayhorn's funeral, Duke Ellington gave the eulogy, and he said nothing mattered more to Billy Strayhorn than the truth. Billy saw a lot of life in those 51 years. It's not so much that you die at a young age, it's what you leave. Everything that he is is there in that music.
the vast majority of our forebears weren't living as lush a life as Billy did, and they often didn't enjoy the same freedoms. In 2001, In the Life paid tribute to a group of everyday heroes whose lives have spanned both the pre- and post-Stonewall eras, and who continue today to do it their way. In West African culture, a griot is a person, often a senior member of the group, who keeps an oral history of the tribe or village. In our next segment, the village is Brooklyn, New York, and we meet a group of gay African-American elders who are finding community and support through sharing history and experience. I was born in Manhattan. I grew up in the Bronx. I was in the Navy. Um, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm a man who's, who's gay. I grew up in Bed-Stuy. I am a grandmother of five grandchildren. Um, I have three kids. I am a single mom. I was married twice. I have a mate now of 16 years as of today, and we're very happy. Uh, my lifestyle is an open book. At one time, it was not. I grew up around here, and I grew up with many lesbians and gays. And uh, as we are getting older, I was seeing less and less, and I would talk to my friends. We were seeing less and less. And some of our friends were going through a lot of different um, problems. They met together as a group. Black, they had known each other since teenagers. And they happened to run into each other on the street, and they said to her, you know one thing? We need, to, we need to form some kind of group or some kind of thing. Not a social thing, but something that would help us, you know? We mailed out a mailing that um, we were trying to start a group for lesbian and gay seniors, you know, who's interested, and many, many people came. And they told everybody that knows somebody to bring somebody. It's like a center for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender seniors of all colors. It's an organization to uh, make a safe space for these seniors and to have some kind of a social outlet. It is an organization for over 50. I'm sure there are gay people in senior centers and other senior centers, but in, it, with us, it's, it's more open, it's free. People can, can discuss and feel comfortable being who they are. Lesbians and gays, uh, when they're old, they not only have to suffer ageism and sexism and racism, you know, homophobia, all that added in the mix, is kind of much. I mean, and uh, we come from a tradition that is supposed to take care of the elders. And uh, that's, we have to remind ourselves that that was what we're supposed to be doing. We try very much to keep, you know, make things available that people can become, you know, uh, more active. We have dances. We have um, uh, game night. We have fitness and aerobics and swimming classes. We had the computer class. Must be about 18 of us in the computer class. This one lady came in and she sat down and she says, oh, Y'all seem like y'all know y'all know each other. You know, everybody here seems so for me. So one of the girls said, Yeah, we're a gay organization. She said, You what? She said, a gay organization. She sat there a few minutes for you. See, she got her back and she ran out the room. <laughs> you know, because she said, There's so many of us in there. I guess she said, My God, what are these people gonna do to me? <laughs> We've had one of our sex toys, which was a sold out, you know, almost turn, turned people away. You'd be surprised. And only a fraction of seniors even go to senior centers. And of that fraction that go, of course, many are gay. But the older gay community is really used to living what you call in the closet. So when they go, they hide most of themselves, and they're afraid of discrimination, and they can never really completely relax. I can respect and understand those who have to still be in the closet because of the homophobic that we have out here. Um, their jobs, their neighbors, the community, and also their family. So I could respect that. But that does not say that uh, they're, they're not in the life or they're trying to hide something. They're just cautious is the word I would use. It was serious, serious consequence if you were found to be lesbian or gay. I mean, you live in a very different time now. 
I went into the Navy in uh, 1960, so I was 19 years old, and I was a year out of high school. In the Navy, I had, uh, well, I was stationed in two places. I had a boyfriend when I was in Illinois. Um, I had a boyfriend also in, in, in Massachusetts, you know, but all that was off the base. I kept, I kept my life separate. But you see, when you were coming up as a, a young lady or young gentleman, and they, right away, you have to get married. They put that stigma on you. You know, something is wrong if you don't get married. So, what do you do? You get married, and you still want to do what you want to do. The boyfriend in um, Massachusetts almost cost me an undesirable discharge, because at that time, it was, it was before don't ask, don't tell. You know, don't let me find out. I look back and say, Look at where I am at today, opposed to if I had have still been in the closet and be unhappy, what would I have been? Would I be here? Would I have committed suicide? Never know. I don't walk backwards. I don't talk backwards. I'm going forward with my life. Real Circle uh, says that it's OK to be who you are, and um, it's OK to be comfortable with yourself. I don't have um, family of my own, sir, to say. The griot is my family. The griot is my family. There are lesbians and gays in every town, city, state, in every church, every school. The, the black community knows that. They've always known that there were lesbians and gays among them. Same-sex relationships have been part of the social and political landscape since the very beginning. And while historians have begun to recover evidence of gay and lesbian lives from throughout the past, parts of the story remain untold. In response, gay men and lesbians have created libraries and archives across the country. Major collections include the Lesbian History Archives in New York, the One Institute and Archives in Los Angeles, and the James C. Hormel Gay and Lesbian Center of the San Francisco Public Library. I'm Alec Mappa, and you're watching In the Life. The famous left bank of early 20th century Paris boasted modern masters of all the arts. Among them, Ernest Hemingway, Pablo Picasso, and Romaine Brooks. An American expatriate and one of the center points of left bank society, neither Brooks nor her extraordinary work received the same attention as her artistic contemporaries, perhaps because of her subject matter. By painting striking images of the women in her life, Brooks put a lasting face on a community that challenged both the accepted definitions of womanhood and the negative connotations surrounding homosexuality. Romaine Brooks is a really landmark figure in the development of gay art and gay lesbian consciousness because she was the first artist to really deal with lesbian life and personalities as her primary subject matter. Any woman at that period of time who would go out of her way by choice to paint lesbian subjects, bisexual subjects, uh, would have been extraordinary in any art historical context. There has been a real transformation in the way we understand pictures and artworks to operate historically so that a show now as opposed to say 30 years ago will focus not only on um, the artist's aesthetic achievement but also will think about the way the images say particular things about people or about the culture that they were produced in. Romaine Brooks lived in the lesbian capital of the early 20th century. She was in Paris, she knew everybody who was anybody, and in Paris at that time, women, and especially lesbian women, really dominated the cultural scene. Uh, there were two rival salons, groups of people that gathered for cultural exchange and so forth, and one circled around Brooks and her lover, Natalie Barney, who was a writer, and the other circled around Gertrude Stein and her lover, Alice Toklas. It was the first period and the first place where fairly openly gay people could have some kind of cultural life of their own and have a real impact. Her work focuses almost exclusively on women and there are several images that are distinctly about trying to visualize uh, a lesbian identity. 
portrait of Una Trubridge is one that she actually referred to in a letter as a sign of the age to amuse some future feminists. The short hair of uh, Una Trubridge is an incredibly fashionable way for women to bob their hair and also the sort of deliberately emphasized um, made up lips and the, the very prominent pearl earrings all in some ways almost exaggerate a sense of femininity and then that's placed in contrast with the kind of severe tailoring and the very binding cravat. This image of Peter, a young English girl, that um, has a real gentleness and sensitivity to the sitter's personality um, and a real quietness um, to the portrait itself that is somewhat, I think, at odds with what the contemporary audience would have seen as um, the somewhat shocking nature of her, the fact that she's wearing a man's suit. Any of the people that she was exhibiting for and selling to would have known perfectly well what these works were about because she made portraits of her lovers, she made portraits of well-known lesbian personalities and sold them to those people and exhibited them as such. This painting is in some ways the, the key image to her work in particular because it's a self-portrait. It's very much about her creating a, a public identity for herself. Her 1923 self-portrait is probably the lesbian icon, you know, of the modernist period, so to speak, because it presents such a positive image, such a self-contained image, such a stylish image. I saw it as an extraordinary, forceful, compelling, cruisy portrait. With this more or less androgynous appearance, she's reflecting um, changes in um, you know, women's identity associated with the idea of the modern woman, a sort of early idea of female liberation. This is a painting called Spring from 1912, and it's also uh, one of the images for which Ayada Rubinstein, the Russian dancer, was the model. And it was painted while the two of them were involved in a personal relationship between 1911 and 1914. Most of her nude work that she did is centered around Ida Rubinstein. And I think Ida Rubinstein became a kind of physical ideal for her exploration of the female nude. There was a relatively concentrated period where she was thinking about the subject of the female nude. And what's interesting about it is that was still a fairly controversial subject for a female artist to paint. And she definitely did not back away from that controversy. She's definitely trying to force a recognition of this erotic connection between her as the artist and this female nude as the model. And this painting called The Crossing, in which for all intents and purposes, Ida Rubinstein is shown as a dead woman. But she retains that sense of the almost icy eroticism of Ida Rubinstein's figure. There were certain limits on being a female artist at the turn of the century. And what she does is press those limits and change those limits. And I think, in part, her own personal sexuality is what uh, motivated her to really test those boundaries and to try to revise them. In the 80s, you couldn't do what has been done today in terms of talking about Romaine as a lesbian, putting up place cards with information saying, lesbian, lesbian, lesbian. The L word was just not to be used. In the last 30 years, we've had a whole development of gay and lesbian cultural theory that lets us see what the connections might be between art and life. And in her case, uh, the connections are very powerful. And it gives us an opportunity to look at our history as gays and lesbians and bisexuals and to look at how people presented themselves, how their identities, as it were, were shaped and formed and matured. The idea of gay and lesbian identity has been somewhat erased from the historical record. The idea of, in a sense, rewriting history to include that um, is something that's important to a lot of scholars. Gladys Bentley left home in 1923 at the age of 16 and moved to Harlem. In New York nightclubs and speakeasies, she dressed in men's suits and celebrated her sexuality by singing body parodies of popular songs. In Atlantic City, she even married a woman in a highly publicized ceremony.
But in the 1950s, McCarthyism spread through the country and threatened to destroy the lives of prominent gays and lesbians. Bentley discarded her butch clothes for dresses, cleaned up her act, married a man, and claimed to have cured her lesbianism. She died soon after, in 1960. I'm Cherry Jones, and you're watching In the Life. While Romaine Brooks' outspokenness shaped both her life and her paintings, Billy Tipton found a different way to be true to himself and his gift. Dorothy Lucille Tipton was born in Oklahoma City in 1914 to a family that encouraged her passion for music from a young age. Her goal was to play professionally in a jazz band. There was just one problem. Women in the jazz business usually took a back seat to the men, and Dorothy wanted time in the spotlight. As biographer Diane Middlebrook explains, Dorothy found an unusual solution to achieve her goal. She was going to go audition for a job, and in order to get it, she was going to put on men's clothes. She put on a man's jacket, slicked her hair back, went off, auditioned for the job, got the job, went on the road, came home with money in her pocket, and from that day on, they said, she never looked back. She saw that this was the way that she was going to be able to get what she wanted, which was work in a band. Defying the odds, Billy Tipton carved out a career in the music business that lasted more than 40 years. Billy made his living playing music, and that was hard to do. He wasn't a star, he wasn't a recording star, for example. He was never on television and never made it big, but he had a very solid professional life. On stage and in his private life, Billy guarded his secrets so well that four of his five wives, his three adopted sons, and most of the musicians that he worked and traveled with so that they didn't suspect that Billy was anything other than he seemed. Dorothy found in herself the ability to be an entertainer, an actor, acting the role of a musician, as well as playing the music, and that that double identity was Billy Tipton. Jameson Green, founder of FTM International, a support group for female-to-male transgendered people, suspects that there may have been another factor in Billy's choice besides his love of music. Maybe he put it on as a way to get a job in the beginning, or maybe that's just what he told people because it was a safe thing to say. But ultimately, there's a place where this becomes who you are, and to take that identity off means not being yourself anymore. So in that way, Billy Tipton's experience much more closely relates to the kind of experience that trans people have as he was living as a man, he was able to express himself as a man and able to actualize that identity. Was Billy Tipton a role played with consummate skill by an enterprising and talented actress? Or was Billy the real personality of the girl born as Dorothy? Billy left no memoirs or records, so there is no way of knowing for certain what his true motivations were. He did say to one of his cousins, you know, I'm, I'm a normal person. I'm not a freak. This has been my choice. This, this way of life has been my choice. The important thing to, to be understood about trans people is that they aren't being who they are not. They are being who they are. Billy described himself as a musician and as a man. The most important thing about honoring Billy is not to take those identities away from him. Hi, I'm Felicia Rashad. You're watching America's Gay and Lesbian News Magazine, In the Light. Still to come on In the Life, the man behind the curtain of the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King really wanted his advice and his uh, strategic guidance. Pride and protest. Those early pickets were scary. Without our demonstrations starting in 65, Stonewall would not have happened. And of course, Harvey. And in your perfect world, what would the Heritage of Pride parade look like? The late Bayard Rustin fought passionately to give a voice to the African-American civil rights movement. He wrote the first Civil Rights Act, organized the March on Washington, and brought nonviolence to the movement, the same movement that forced him out because his gayness was a political liability. On tonight's Real to Real, In the Life looks at the documentary Brother Outsider, the life of Bayard Rustin, with directors Bennett Singer and Nancy Cates and executive producer Sam Pollard. 
Brother Outsider is a portrait of Bayard Rustin, who has been called the lost prophet of the civil rights movement. It's about activism. It's about what does it mean to commit yourself to a set of values that you pursue um, without ceasing for your entire life. I felt that it was important and it was time that Bayard Rustin's story was told. You know, we know about Dr. King. We know about A. Philip Randolph. You know, we know about you know, all the other people who have been involved in the struggle, in the civil rights struggle. But Rustin's story is a story untold. There are three ways to deal with injustice. One is to accept it slavishly, or one can resist it with arms, or one can use nonviolence. The man who believes in nonviolence is prepared to be harmed, to be crushed, but he will never crush others. One of our goals in making Brother Outsider was to try to tell the story from Rustin's point of view and to use his first person words through letters and diaries and speeches. With what politician will you agree in November if they don't get off their fannies and do something? Clyde Rustin's a very complicated man who grew up in Pennsylvania. He was a man who, who knew who he was in terms of his identity. He was homosexual and he was not a man to hide from that. I never said to my grandmother, you know, I'm gay. But I told her that I enjoyed being with guys at the high school parties. Her reply was, I suppose that's what you need to do. It was never an encouragement, but it was a recognition, so I never had feelings of guilt. There were thousands of pages of surveillance on Rustin um, conducted from the 40s onward. And we took excerpts from those pieces um, to show how the government was perceiving him as a, um, a sexual pervert, to quote the FBI files. FBI field report. On November 15, 1963, a wiretap was instituted on Bayard Rustin. Rustin is a prominent advisor to Martin Luther King Jr. and a known sexual pervert. During World War II, Rustin, for religious reasons, refused to register for the draft and was a conscientious objector who ended up paying a pretty heavy price for that. I was sentenced to three years in federal prison because I could not religiously and conscientiously accept killing my fellow man. He frequently said that guns and, and violent means couldn't, um, couldn't achieve victory in the civil rights movement. And he looked to Gandhi as a very clear and inspiring role model. I want no human being to die or to be brutalized because I thoroughly believe that this struggle can be won without brutalization. In the 40s, Rustin's activism was incredibly brave and incredibly dangerous. A lot of times he was single-handedly protesting segregation on buses and was arrested 24 times over the course of his career. I have traveled in 20 states and covered something over 10,000 miles in the last nine months. I have traveled extensively among Negro groups, attempting to create an interest in nonviolent direct action. He was a gay man in an era in which it was not okay for someone to be gay. And the film also explores the hypocrisy or the frustrating weirdness about these liberal and progressive movements that were trying to make social change and trying to say that they wanted a better world, but they didn't want an openly gay person in their better world. He made a conscious decision to stay in the background and to um, really avoid the limelight, avoid being the center of attention, because he knew that, um, that for the sake of the movement, his homosexuality would be seen as a political liability. But instead of simply dropping out or, you know, disappearing, he, he realized that he had a, um, quite an important role to play. And people came to him, such as Martin Luther King, really wanted his advice and his uh, strategic guidance and his mentoring. Um, and so he did play a, a very key role. In 1960, Adam Clayton Powell threatened to go to the press with a false rumor um, that Bayard, Bayard Rustin and Martin Luther King were engaged in a sexual affair, which was completely untrue. But the reason behind that was that Rustin and King had planned a demonstration at the 1960 Democratic Convention, 
which Adam Clayton Powell didn't want to see happen. He was the force behind the, the, uh, the march on Washington. When anyone sees that wonderful footage in the Washington Mall, you know, when you see the pictures of Dr. King or A. Philip Randolph or Ossie Davis or, you know, anybody up there on the podium, the man on the, on the periphery of that whole thing that happened at the March on Washington was Bayard Rustin. I now bring to you the executive director of the March on Washington, the man who organized this whole thing, Mr. Bayard Rustin. He was an African-American gay activist, um, though he was vilified by people inside and outside the movement. People will be forced to, to think about the fact that a gay man did play a, a hugely influential role in the civil rights movement, and um, I'm hoping that that will break down some stereotypes or help people overcome whatever prejudices they may have about, um, about gay people. 30 years ago, the barometer of human rights in the United States were black people. That is no longer true. The barometer for judging the character of people in regard to human rights is now those who consider themselves uh, gay, homosexual, lesbian. One of the most vocal advocates for the relationship between the African-American civil rights movement and the LGBT rights movement has been Dr. Martin Luther King's own widow, Coretta Scott King. When the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, or ENDA, was introduced in 1994, Mrs. King said, for too long, our nation has tolerated the insidious form of discrimination against this group of Americans. I believe that freedom and justice cannot be parceled out in pieces to suit political convenience. Like Martin, I don't believe you can stand for freedom for one group of people and deny it to others. The great promise of American democracy is that no group of people will be forced to suffer discrimination and injustice. I'm Bill Coleman, and you're watching In the Life. The first stirrings of America's gay rights movement had begun as early as the 1940s. And by the mid-60s, several years before Stonewall, a small group of gay and lesbian activists decided it was time to go public and began staging quiet but courageous demonstrations. This is the front of the famous Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and this is where we had gay picketing demonstrations every July 4 from 1965 through 1969. People think of the Stonewall Rebellion as um, uh, the start of the gay civil rights movement. That's a myth. There was a movement starting back in the late 1940s, and it gradually evolved, and it picked up steam, and we were doing this very revolutionary picketing in the 1960s before Stonewall ever happened. Frank Kameny was instrumental in organizing the pickets, not only in Philadelphia, but also in Washington, D.C., where he keeps an informal archive of the picket signs in his attic. These are stacks of various gay-related uh, picketing signs from a variety of demonstrations in Washington and also Philadelphia in the middle 60s. Um, activism and expressions of dissent hadn't uh, reached the levels that they did by the latter 60s. And picketing in some such places as the front of the White House was the extreme expression of dissent par excellence. Things hadn't gone beyond that yet. There had been a big debate within the gay movement about whether or not we should have public demonstrations. And a lot of it was based on the fear we thought, boy, if somebody knew you were gay, they'd stone you to death or, you know, attack you. You know, we didn't dare walk holding a sign saying that we were homosexuals. See, in those days, people thought it was very much smarter to uh, pass and uh, that people who didn't want to pass were uh, just inviting trouble. Nobody was out then. I was probably, certainly, for example, in my group down here, I was the only person who used my own name. Those early pickets were scary. It was scary because there were so few of us who could take the risk of being so public. 
For example, um, what if my boss sees me on the six o'clock news and fires me? Or what if my picture appears on the front page of my parents' hometown newspaper and causes grief or shockwaves in the town? And uh, what if some bystander starts throwing insults at us or worse, bricks or stones? Uh, and what is the government going to do with all those photographs and tape recordings that they're taking of us? We had a dress code. And it's easy now to look back and uh, laugh at it and make fun of it because it was a very strict code. But I think it was appropriate for the time, and I strongly supported it at the time. And I think it was right then because we were trying to get across a very unpopular message. We didn't want people to gawk at us. We wanted them to gawk at the messages on our signs in, and in our leaflets. Well, the philosophy um, was to make us look normal the way everybody else looked. So did we succeeded so well that, uh, as Frank Kameny said, um, some people thought we were actors. I remember specifically when we picketed in front of the Civil Service Commission, my, uh, um, my approach was, they, we want them to employ us. Therefore, within the normal mode of the day, uh, we have to give the appearance of being employable. We were representing, we felt, all those hundreds of thousands or millions of other Americans that were homosexual. This is independence. National what we saw it was a, a chance to remind uh, Americans on July 4th that we were equal citizens. And uh, what better place to do that than in front of the Liberty Bell? Independence Hall is where the thing was done. Both the uh, Declaration of Independence um, and uh, the Constitution were right there. It was right after the parade, the July 4th parade, and the, uh, the folding chairs were stacked up still and, and everything had been dismantled, the bleachers, and so then we came on and, and picketed it. I just felt a sense of, of uh, commitment and a sense of uh, passionate involvement. And there was a surprising lack of negativity there on the part of uh, bystanders. I think they, they were surprised, uh, but they didn't give us any trouble that I recall. There was a photographer there who told me that all I needed was a good man, you know. Just, or perhaps he even said that all I needed to do was sleep with the man. And, and I, I said something like I didn't need that or something, and I, I just filmed, you know, and he stuck out his tongue at me. At the end, uh, um, on a signal, everybody, we had, you know, signs on sticks, and everybody flipped down their signs. The demonstration was over. Once the flag lowering music that was from the loudspeaker uh, started and we saw the flag lowering, we all stood and uh, put our right hand over our heart just to show that we were uh, good patriots and we respected the flag. You know, we were first class American citizens and we had wanted, that's a message we had wanted to tell everyone from the beginning. We are first class citizens. We are not marginal people. I feel that those demonstrations led directly into Stonewall in 69, and that without our demonstrations starting in 65, Stonewall would not have happened. Because what they did was to create the mindset for gay people who had never ever before done this to demonstrate publicly, to dissent publicly, to, to do things out in the open. And no, nobody had ever done this before. The 1969 demonstration took place just about a week after the Stonewall Rebellion in New York City. A lot of people who were fired up by the fight against the police at Stonewall came down to Philadelphia or came from other cities into Philadelphia and joined the demonstration and it was the largest we had ever had. There were about 150 people. That sounds like very little today, but for us it was a huge turnout. Here we saw 
uh, men in blue jeans, t-shirts. We saw a mixture, and it was like the transition from the old to the new. Coming out in a picket line in 1965 was downright revolutionary for that time. It really took gumption and the conviction that we were right and the world was wrong. We were just at the start of cracking that cocoon of invisibility. It was sort of a movement pulling itself up by its bootstraps. If you want to pursue the metaphor, we created the bootstraps and then other people pulled and pulled and pulled and up it went. Pretty soon you have um, marches on Washington with hundreds of thousands of people. In 1950, a United States Senate report targeted homosexuals as a government security risk. Untold numbers of suspected gay men and lesbians lost their jobs. Today, just over 50 years later, the human rights campaign has identified well over 2,000 companies, colleges and universities, state and local governments, and federal agencies that have written non-discrimination policies covering sexual orientation. I'm Sam Behrens. You're watching In the Life. The early picketers used well-mannered visibility to challenge anti-gay discrimination. But once the LGBT community began to cultivate a sense of our own rights, others took off the kid gloves. Stormy Delavier was born to a wealthy white father and a black mother in New Orleans, Christmas Eve, 1920. Caught between two worlds from the day she was born, her father had her privately educated while her grandfather raised her. If the white kids were beating me up, the black kids were beating me up, everybody was jumping on me. If it wasn't for because of my father's money, it was because of being, black, being a, a Negro with a white face. Yeah. So he told me if I didn't stop running, I'd be running the rest of my life. And. When I was 15, I stopped running, and I haven't run a day since. Stormy sang with jazz bands across the country, developing a signature silvery baritone that would serve her well in her next incarnation. And in 1955, Stormy became the one girl in the Jewel Box Review, a traveling musical show of gender deception. While her girlfriend watched from the wings, Stormy would now perform as a man. Somebody told me that I couldn't do it and that I, I would completely ruin my reputation and that people did not have enough problems being black. I said, I didn't have any problem with it. Everybody else did. I tried to do the proper thing, you know, wear men's clothes on stage and wear women's clothes on the street. I got picked up twice for being a drag queen. Well, the guy uh, that arrested me once for being a drag queen came in, loved me, said, he said, you don't know how to tie. I said, well, if I'm not tying my tie right, why don't you come in every night and show me how I'm supposed to tie? And he did. To this day, I can tie a bow tie with even looking in the mirror, and it'll be perfect. He was a nice man. He was only doing his job. In June of 1969, Stormy found herself at the epicenter of the Stonewall riots and a long-standing debate over her role in the historic event. Well, I got into it by accident. And then uh, <laughs> Charles Kaiser, when he wrote his book, uh, Gay Metropolis, was trying to figure out how it started when the fight really started. They were just running around, you know, calling uh, names and things and throwing toilet paper down from the windows and what have you. And I just walked up. I, I used to come in whenever I came in town to go down to see if anybody needed help or if they were in jail. I could get them out, what, what I could do. I looked like I was 20, but. When that happened, I was 40, 48 years old. Many different people say that there was a cross-dressing lesbian who sparked the Stonewall riot, but to the best of my knowledge, no one had ever found someone who fit the description quite as well as she does until I interviewed her, and she said, the cop hit me and I hit him back. I walked away with him, an eye bleeding, but he was laying on the ground, out. Stormy, an appropriate name for a woman who has weathered confrontation and controversy for over 80 years, remains a living legend in the West Village, known for her kindness and loyalty. Gay people are always looking for role models. It's a cliche, but it's true, and she's as good a one as we're going to find. 
This is Quentin Crisp for In The Light. And finally, Harvey's take on the work left for today's LGBT community. <laughs> There's some funny stuff in there. I'm getting into it. That's a long way back. Okay, here's a lecture from Being Useful in This World 101. You know, I hate doing this to your kids, but sometimes you leave me no choice. This past gay day, I was complaining to a new acquaintance how peeved I was to be working and therefore unable to march in the annual gay day parade. Hey, says he, I never go. Hate that march. I tried to stay calm. Hate it you do. And what is it you hate about it? Oh, man, all those freaks out there naked in the streets and the drag queens and those topless dykes. I want no part of it. Never go near it. Still biting my tongue. And in your perfect world, what would the Heritage of Pride parade look like? Well, how about having some normal-looking people? Aren't we just people? Why do we only see freaks and drag queens and flapping private parts? Why doesn't the parade ever look like me and my friends? We're part of the community, too. Actually, I answered in measured tones. If you sit at home and let the rest of us do your work, you're not really part of the community. You're a leech, a hanger-on a drain on the energies and resources of the rest of us. And furthermore, if you want to know why the parade does not look like you, it's because you and your friends sit at home and complain instead of showing up. You want to be represented? Then represent. Pick your lazy butt up, get it out on the street, and stop making everyone else do the work for you. Oh, you're the first one to celebrate Supreme Court giving us a victory. But do you ever do anything to make it happen? We know you weren't out there on the streets protesting with the freaks and drag queens. So what did you do? Did you send a check to Lambda Legal Defense Fund? Did you write a letter to your congressperson telling them you're an openly homosexual person in their district? Did you write a letter to the editor of your local paper demanding full rights of citizenship? Ever call your local TV station and ask to be represented in their programming? Are you even out to everyone in your life? If you want the community to reflect who you are, you have to be part of the community. If you want the parade to look like you, you gotta be in it. And if you want to celebrate our victories with any honest feeling, then do some of the hard work that makes victories possible. The rest of us are plenty tired of carrying you. And by the way, there are tens of thousands of regular looking folks marching every single year. Why the media never shows them on TV or in photos is grist for another entire program. See you next month. I'm Leslie Gore. For all of us at In The Live here at Biscaya Lounge in New York, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next month. In The Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation. The Pride Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Overbrook Foundation, the Ted Snowden Foundation, the Arcus Foundation, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, the B.W. Bastion Foundation, the Fowler Bombardier Charitable Family Trust, and in the life members like you.